Thank you. Um, welcome to our webinar on uh, Scotland's Deposit Return Scheme and the roles and responsibilities of drinks retailers. Uh, my name is Charles Livingston. I'm a partner in the Government Regulation and Competition team at Brodie's. I'm joined today by Grant Strachan, who's a senior associate in our Commercial Services Unit. Um, Grant and I have each been doing um, quite a lot of work on the DRS um, recently and at the moment. Um, this is the uh, second of two webinars on the DRS. We did one yesterday uh, in relation to the roles and responsibilities of producers. I'm conscious that there is some overlap um, between uh, the audiences, um, but uh, the the overlap is not total. So there are people uh, on today for whom this is new. So if, uh, particularly in the, the earlier stages, um, if you were on yesterday and you're hearing things that you heard yesterday, apologies, but there there are people who will be hearing it for the first time. So um, we, will, we will proceed on that basis. Um, you will get a link to uh, this recording and yesterday's recording together. Um, so if you're a, a retailer who's also a producer, um, or a producer who's also a retailer, depending on what you prioritise, um, then you'll get a link to both webinars. Um, so uh, getting going on the substance, Scotland's Deposit Return Scheme is set out in the Deposit and Return Scheme for Scotland Regulations 2020. Uh, at least the legal requirements of it are. There's lots of other stuff uh, around the legislation, um, some of which Grant will get into later. Um, but those are the key regulations. Just a health warning, if you are uh, wanting to look those up online, there are amendments pending uh, to the regulations that you won't find on legislation.gov. So if you're not using something um, that's sort of bespoke uh, for legislation like Westlaw or something like that, you may not necessarily be looking at what the, the final version is. Um, so just a, a warning on that, that there are live amendments that haven't, haven't yet been made, but will be made by the time it comes into force. So what does the DRS do? It introduces mandatory compliance obligations uh, for uh, essentially everybody in the supply chain. Um, so that's producers, importers, wholesalers, and most importantly for today's purposes, retailers, uh, which includes online retailers and the hospitality sector, as we'll get into later. Um, and it will apply to uh, the vast majority of drinks that are sold in Scotland in single use containers. And we'll, we'll unpack the products that are in scope uh, in a moment. Um, but the overriding objective of the DRS is to increase recycling rates for those containers that are in scope, increase the quality of recycling to encourage closed loop recycling, um, and to reduce litter um, by incentivizing um, the people who have the empty items to uh, take them back somewhere rather than leaving them uh, in, well, in a public bin, let alone in a park or on the street. Um, the DRS is a form of extended producer responsibility. Um, you'll, you will sometimes see it uncharitably described as being based on the polluter pays principle. Um, I'm not sure that's entirely accurate. You know, we're not talking about a byproduct here. We're talking about the product itself to some extent. Um, so extended producer responsibility is a more accurate term. Um, and it, it involves uh, ensuring that the responsibility for product disposal and recycling um, ends up back with the drinks producers. Um, and there are obviously uh, significant roles for people, other people in the supply chain to play, particularly retailers. But ultimately, it's all a mechanism um, by which to, to get products back to their original uh, producers. Um, the DRS scheme will now go live on the 16th of August of this year. Um, it has been delayed a couple of times. Um, we are uh, well aware of the fact that there is quite a lot of clamor from industry uh, for, for it to be delayed again. Um, there was also a, a report commissioned by the Scottish Government indicating that there were, there were some pretty high risks associated with the scheme going live on the current date. Um, we're not going to speculate on whether there will be any extension. Um, if you were asking us for advice, our advice would be that you need to plan on the basis that the date is going to be the current date. Um, because uh, if, you, uh, if you gamble on it being extended, uh, and haven't got your ducks in a row in time, then you will find yourself in quite a lot of difficulty if it turns out uh, it's not extended. So moving on, um, the mechanics of the scheme, well, the fundamental principle is that there should be a, a 20 pence um, deposit displayed, uh, not displayed, uh, paid, um, 20 pence deposit paid on, on any item of uh, packaging, paid at each stage, um, of its supply, so each each point which it works through the supply chain. 
um, that ultimately gets returned to the customer when the customer returns the item to the producer uh, via the dedicated scheme, which in most cases will mean via a retailer. Um, containers of all sizes have the same 20p deposit uh, and all in scope materials, uh, it's the same 20p deposit. So it doesn't matter what size or what material the container is. The deposit flow is intended to be cost neutral. By that, uh, we mean that nobody is left, should be left 20p out of pocket if the deposit makes its way through the system as is, as is intended. Um, it's obviously the case that there may be significant compliance costs and, and other costs, so it's not cost neutral in that sense. But in terms of the deposit mechanism itself, um, nobody is uh, supposed to be left out of pocket by that. So to give you an example, um, and in this example, we've assumed that the producer has signed up with the scheme administrator, which Grant may touch on again a little bit later, that concept. Um, but if the producer has signed up with the scheme administrator, then the first step is that the producer pays a 20p deposit to the administrator for each bottle or can that it puts into the supply chain for the Scottish market. The producer then sells to a wholesaler. It charges the wholesaler 20p on each bottle and can. So the producer is now all square. The wholesaler then charges 20p to the retailer for each item. So the wholesaler is all square. The retailer then charges the consumer the 20p um, for the bottle or can. So at this point, the retailer is not out of pocket. Um, the consumer returns the empty bottle or can to the retailer and gets the 20p back. Um, at this point, the retailer is out of pocket again, um, but uh, the, the idea is that the retailer then um, arranges uh, or makes the item available for collection by the scheme administrator. And then, and when the item is collected, the scheme administrator gives 20p to the retailer. So the 20p makes its way around the system in the opposite direction to the product at each stage. Um, I should say that if, uh, if you're selling products, if you're a hospitality business and you're selling products for consumption on the premises, and we'll come back to this in a bit more detail, um, but uh, you would basically skip uh, the uh, fifth and sixth um, or fourth and fifth steps in that example. Um, so the, if you're a hospitality retailer, you would pay the 20p deposit. You wouldn't then charge it to your customer because the customer isn't taking it away. Um, so you just uh, collect it once they've finished um, and you then return it to the scheme administrator and get your 20p back that way. So, so the, you cut the consumer out of the process for articles that are for consumption on the premises. Um, okay, on our next slide, uh, we cover the obligation to charge the deposit. Um, so that arises when the article is first placed on the market, so when it's first put into the supply chain for sale in Scotland, and then at each subsequent step in the supply chain, as you've seen on the previous slide. And the obligation is set out in Regulation 5, which we've just quoted, so it's 5.2a. Any person who markets, offers for sale, or sells a scheme article in Scotland must charge a deposit when marketing, offering for sale, or selling a scheme article in Scotland. Um, so uh, that applies at each step, it's not limited to retailers. And the 20p is charged on each individual item. So if, for example, you have a multi-pack of six cans, it's 20p per can. So the deposit that needs to be paid for the multi-pack is £1.20. Um, and uh, the, the, the obvious idea behind that is that each can will then make its way back into the system or certainly may well make its way back into the system separately. So each carries a separate deposit. Um, there are certain exceptions to the deposit charging obligation. So export shops, duty free and things like that. Um, articles that are marketed, offered for sale or sold exclusively for consumption on the premises as I covered on the last slide and articles that are intended for retail sale outside Scotland. So that's that last point is further up the supply chain than today's audience is really going to be concerned with because if you're a retailer uh, selling to customers in Scotland, then you will need to charge the deposit. Um, so on our next slide, um, I'll talk about the, uh, the products that are in scope um, and the concept that's used in the legislation is uh, this term scheme articles. Um, so a scheme article is, is any drink, alcoholic or non-alcoholic, that is uh, contained and sold in packaging that meets the criteria you can see on the slide. So uh, made from um, PET plastic, glass, steel or aluminium. 
that covers pretty much all drinks other than dairy. Um, so the, the plastic that's used in milk bottles uh, is, is not PET um, and it doesn't cover um, the sort of treated cardboard Tetra Pak style packaging, but pretty much everything else um, is, uh, is within scope, every other type of material. Um, packaging has to be designed to contain between 50 mils and three liters of liquid and designed to be sealed. So made both airtight and watertight at the point of sale. Um, and uh, it needs to be such that the, the customer cannot return it to its point of sale state. So once you've opened your um, bottle of fizzy juice and you've had all the little plastic bits crack off, you can't return it to its original state. Um, and the packaging also has to be single use packaging. So essentially not, not designed or intended for multiple refills or anything like that. Um, in addition, the drink uh, has to be first made available by the producer to be marketed, offered for sale or sold on or after the 16th of August 2023. So the scheme um, and the deposit obligation will apply to products that are put uh, into the supply chain after the go live date of the 16th of August. Um, and we'll come back to this point, but um, products that uh, are already in the supply chain at that date can continue to circulate. You don't need to charge a deposit on them or display information in respect of them. Um, and then the third criteria um, is that the product has to have been made available by the producer to be marketed, offered for sale or sold for the purposes of its retail sale in Scotland. So essentially that means that you can only sell products that have been specifically identified for sale in Scotland. Um, that's uh, backed up by um, a, a criminal offence which says that it is illegal um, from the 16th of August to market, offer for sale or sell to a consumer in Scotland. So this is at the final consumer stage, consumer facing stage of the supply chain. An article that meets conditions one and two. So it's made of the right packaging. It was put into the supply chain on or after the 16th of August, but not condition three. So it's not an item that was made available for retail sale in Scotland. Um, that will be a criminal offence um, and punishable by a fine. And the, the reason for that is, is really as an anti-avoidance um, provision. It's to ensure that um, only uh, items on which the deposit has been paid then go into circulation and are sold to consumers in Scotland. So rather than um, somebody going down to England and buying lots of cans and then uh, not paying the deposit on them, bringing them back and selling them in Scotland. That's what that offence is intended to catch. Um, there is a defence of uh, to that to that offence of um, having taken reasonable precautions to avoid committing it, and having undertaken um, due diligence to try and avoid committing it. Um, so, uh, if if you are a retailer, you may not know exactly whether the producer of the product. Um, had allocated it for retail sale in Scotland. Um, so it, it's not absolute liability there, but you do need to be taking some sort of step to try and get comfort there. Um, there are potentially significant logistical challenges in relation to that. Um, some products will have specific labeling or specific barcodes to say that they're Scotland only, to say that they're part of the DRS scheme, but that's not essential. Um, and we may come back to that. Um, so uh, for, for that sort of product, a product that's just circulating with a UK wide barcode, if you're a retailer, you're probably gonna be needing to look uh, to your supplier to get comfort um, that it is, a, uh, it is a product that's in scope of the DRS and that it is lawful to, to sell it in Scotland. So uh, having covered those preliminaries, I'll hand over to Grant, who's going to cover some of the much more retailer specific aspects of what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, and good afternoon to everyone. So I'm going to be covering the concept of who is a, ret a retailer under the, under, the, under the 2020 regulations, as well as looking to the core obligations of a retailer, including the uh, return point um, requirements, uh, take back service requirements for online retailers and uh, the charging of handling fees as well. So first turning to the concept of who a retailer actually is. So Regulation 18 of the 2020 regulations define this as a person who markets, offers for sale or sells a scheme article to a consumer in Scotland. Now this would cover uh, a range of retail services, including face-to-face -face retail, uh, online or distance sales, uh, which we'll, I'll, I'll come to as a separate slide because that warrants specific treatment in its own right. 
sales in hospitality settings, as well as sales through vending machines. Now, um, online retail is actually included within, within the scope of the regulations. So a business that markets or offers for sale or sells a scheme article to consumers in Scotland uh, is, is within scope. Now, what's important there is that the, the location of the online reta retailer is not considered here. So you could be an online retailer in England or, or overseas, but if you're marketing products for sale to Scottish customers, then you fall within the scope of the, of the DRS. In addition, who and what is excluded? Um, what other exclusions apply? So Charles has mentioned a few of these already. Um, the DRS does not apply to products that are attended or marketed for sale outside Scotland. Um, it also doesn't apply to businesses that sell scheme articles exclusively for consumption on site. So uh, bars and restaurants, etc. And Charles covered that in the context of the circular flow of the, uh, of the, of the deposit arrangements. So if we turn to the, the next slide on information obligations, um, or sorry, the, the obligations on sales. So for sales of drinks within Scotland, the following obligations will apply. First of all, um, a retailer must only sell drinks to consumers that a producer has made available uh, for sale in Scotland. There is also a, uh, a due diligence type requirement that retailers must discharge here. So uh, retailers must ensure the scheme articles that are sold to consumers were produced by a producer that was registered uh, under, under the scheme. Now, all producers will need to register. We covered this in, in yesterday's session. Um, all producers that have registered will, uh, will be listed on a, on a database. And so that should be a searchable database. And so retailers can discharge that obligation by, by doing those checks. Um, and finally, charging the 20p deposit when selling a scheme article. So companies that sell drinks online, as I've mentioned before, are, are within scope uh, and indeed it is the operator of the website or indeed an online marketplace that would hold that compliance obligation and indeed liability for any potential non-compliance. Uh, vending machine sales is, is quite a curious one here because it's the owner of the machine who is responsible if they are identified on the machine or alternatively, it's the person who's managing the premises where the machine is located that would hold the compliance obligation. Um, hospitality businesses that sell drinks are going to be covered as well, um, but fundamentally or crucially rather, the deposit only needs to be charged for scheme articles that are sold off premises, on premises sales or outside scope. Um, and finally, on that point, the scheme articles that are placed in the market prior to 16th of August, 2023, are classified as non-scheme articles, so they are outside scope and can continue to flow through the supply chain. If we look at some of the information obligations uh, and the reporting requirements that, um, that retail outlets must, must provide. So there's a requirement to clearly display the information on, uh, on scheme articles, and the, the legislation refers to this as the requirement to display information in any place where the scheme article is displayed for sale. Um, now, some, some of this is common sense, but it ultimately goes to consumer, uh, consumer information, so presenting information to consumers clearly and in a legible way um, that the article is within scope of the DRS and therefore that um, those in scope articles will be, will be subject to the, the deposit charge. Um, the amount of the deposit being 20 pence and also clearly displaying information on the premises about the how, how the customer can redeem the, the deposit. Um, similarly, applying that to online sales, the, the information must be presented on the, on the website itself or indeed on the online marketplace where the operator is, is classed as, the, as a retailer. Um, again, a similar approach to, uh, to vending machines where the, uh, the information needs to be presented actually on, on the machine and in a visible place to, to customers or consumers. Now, with respect to non-scheme articles, a retailer has to communicate to the purchaser at the point of sale that a particular article is not a scheme article and therefore doesn't fall within the scope of the regulations, meaning that a deposit uh, does, does not apply to that particular product. Now, the, the, the principle here around communication at the point of sale may actually be different from displaying information requirement. Um, any, any sales, and we've, we've touched on this already, that the, any, any sales uh, scheme articles 
will not apply if they're sold exclusively for on-premises consumption, i.e. Um, on-premises uh, bars or restaurants in, in a hospitality setting. I'm going to turn now to look at some of the return point requirements. So under the uh, under the 2020 regulations, the retailers uh, must operate a return point unless they are exempt. Now a consumer, the principle basic being that a consumer will be able to take back uh, an empty bottle or to any return point and then claim the deposit back. Now these return points can be operated either manually or, or through an RVM, a reverse vending machine. So manually is where a customer clearly would just take back that container over the counter and they receive their 20 pence back. Um, the, the customer is then paid from the retailer's own funds, uh, who's then reimbursed by the uh, scheme administrator following, following collection. So the, the principle, and all, all being well, would see that all participants, producer, retail, and the consumer would ultimately uh, have their 20p back and no one is, is left out, out of pocket. Now, as Charles mentioned on yesterday's, uh, on yesterday's call, whilst that circular economy principle applies, we do appreciate that the, the payment of, of fees by, by producers and the, and the handling point uh, charges and costs of, of infrastructure and resource, et cetera, and compliance pr does present a significant burden, and that's certainly not, um, not to be taken lightly. I'm going to continue on the next next theme of return or, or same theme rather of return point obligations. So what does a, re a retailer need to do to comply with a return point requirements? First of all, they need to accept uh, containers that are returned. They pay the customer the 20 pence. Uh, they store all of those containers ready for collection by uh, by the scheme administrator who's acting on behalf of the scheme, acting on behalf of the uh, uh, of the producer, so if a scheme administrator is appointed, that scheme administrator would be would be engaged to then go and pick up all of the articles at the at a given uh, return point. Um, the retailer also needs to clearly display information about a complaints procedure. Um, so a consumer would need to have uh, access to contact details for SEPA if they wanted to, to raise a complaint, um, and that needs to be uh, be displayed um, at the uh, at the return point as well. A return point operator can refuse to accept drinks containers. Some, some of these uh, exclusions are fairly, uh, fairly self-evident and common sense. So for example, where an article is not identifiable as a scheme article, articles that are either soiled, broken, or not otherwise intact uh, that contain liquid, um, or if the operator has requested a collection, but not, that collection has not been carried out as, as it should have been. Then the final exemption here is slightly open to interpretation, but requires that if a customer tries to return an empty scheme container and that exceeds the number of our scheme articles that the retailer would normally sell in a single transaction, then the retailer can refuse to accept that. So for example, if a, if, if a small uh, small retailer tradi traditionally sold um, drinks articles and, and scheme articles you know through, through a small fridge in a, in a corner shop for instance and if a customer came in with bucket loads of of articles for uh, for reimbursement then i think a retailer may reasonably object to that um again there's there's no there's no uh, de minimis or, or ma maximum quantity specified in the guidance so that does indeed uh, lend itself to as being open to interpretation Finally, on return points, it's possible for businesses uh, or organisations to set up re voluntary return points. So um, that can be set up by an organisation or a business that has no compliance obligations um, at the outset under the 2020 regulations, but nevertheless chooses to, to set one up. And the example there may be schools, shopping centres or other community groups, etc. So looking at some of the other uh, return point exemptions certain premises uh need not operate a return point and charles covered those already so for example export export shops um the scheme articles are sold solely by a vending machine or, or distance sale hospitality premises that sell articles for consumption on the premises um, or premises that are granted an exemption by the scottish minister so what would those exemptions look like so the two broad categories would fall under either proximity or what's referred to as a proximity exemption or environmental health exemption. So proximity being where there is an alternative return point close enough to that retailer 
um, and where the operator has agreed to accept re returns um, on the retailer's behalf, um, that's that's something that would be would allow that retailer to to obtain an exemption. And um, also environmental health grounds if the retailer's premises are not suitable, or if by operating a return point they would fall foul of particular or rather specific legislation such as health and safety, fire safety, or, or public health. Um, also, any retailer, if they are granted an exemption, they must communicate that to the consumers. First of all, they need to make the consumer aware that it's not operating a return point. And in practical terms, they need to help the consumer to identify uh, by, by naming or showing alternative um, return points, i.e. the nearest return point that would be available to, to that customer. So online distance retail, as I mentioned earlier, online retail is included within scope of the regulations. Um, online retailers do not need to operate a return point, but they do need to offer a take back service that similarly would allow consumers to return empty scheme articles. Um, however, that said, there is potentially amendments to, to that broad obligation. On the 15th of December, last year um, an amendment to the 2020 regulations was proposed that would basically um, only bring in the largest grocery retailers to the scope of the take back service obligation um, and then for the remainder of online retailers the the new date of 2025 uh, has been has been proposed uh, i'm not aware of of any further developments on on that at the moment and so it's very much a watch this space and we need to see how that will how that will pan out. But at the moment, there is a an amendment pending that clearly would have a significant impact on the uh, on the scope of online retailers' obligations. Um, where a take back service does apply, it must be offered at the point of delivery. So, if a customer had an order delivered to their home address, uh, the take back collection service would be from that same address. Now, uh, clearly, customers through buying drinks or online sales they do not need to use the take back service they can return items to any other collection point or sorry return point um, the retailer can provide the take back service or it indeed can be carried out by someone else on behalf of that retailer finally uh, the obligation to pay the deposit amount does not apply again if the item is soiled broken not empty um, or it's not identifiable as a drs scheme article uh, the, the final final point to cover here is in relation to uh, handling fees. So return point operators or retailers operating a take back service can reasonably charge or can charge a reasonable handling fee from the producer or scheme administrator in respect of each item that, uh, that they return. The basic principle behind uh, a return point is to allow um, is to allow a retailer to, to be reimbursed for basically their, their compliance efforts in, um, in operating a take back service or a return point. So it's really intended to reflect the costs associated with the collection and storage of scheme packaging. So that would include, for example, any materials used for the collection and storage um, by a hospitality retailer and storing those articles for a return to the producer or scheme administrator, uh, the value of dedicated floor space or staff time, any costs incurred in, uh, in obtaining or maintaining, for example, a reverse vending machine. Uh, and then in, in relation to a take back service, it'd be any of the costs associated with, for example, uh, use of vehicles, fuel costs and delivery costs, etc. Um, now, the final point just to flag is that the, the handling fees is, is currently under consideration and subject to uh, judicial review. Um, and on that point, I'm going to hand back to, to Charles to to summarize some of the key key takeaways. Yeah. Thanks, Grant. So yeah, the key takeaways, no pun intended, um, or maybe it was intended, I don't know. Um, so you need to ensure that drinks that you're selling from the 16th of August are either non-scheme articles, meaning they were in the supply chain before that date, or they comply with the DRS, meaning the producer has been registered and the product was intended for sale in Scotland. Um, I think you, you you will want to be asking yourselves, uh, will you be able to confirm those points? Um, and bearing in mind that these are backed by these obligations are backed by criminal offences, 
you would want to have the the stated defense in mind, which is that you had carried out reasonable endeavors and you'd performed the due diligence that you could, that you reasonably could, um, to to satisfy yourself that you were in fact allowed to sell um, the articles. Um, there is a, a, a register uh, that's going to be published by SEPA in terms of registered producers, Grant mentioned, I think um, that will be uh, available to be checked. Being able to connect a product to a producer is not necessarily going to be a simple task, though. Um, ultimately, getting comfort from your supplier um, may be sufficient um, as long as uh, you know the the supplier is is reliable and and uh, you can reasonably be entitled to um, to rely on them. Um, then that that may be the way to do it. Obviously, retailers. Um, are not certainly smaller retailers are not going to have full visibility of what's happened at every step in the supply chain right back to what when when the producer uh, whether or when the producer allocated a given item for sale in Scotland. Um, Grant's mentioned the information obligations. Uh, they they are um, there are quite a few different ones um, for retailers. Some requiring display, some only requiring communication. So that might be a case of verbal communication. Um, so anticipate how you'll comply with those for both pre-DRS and DRS items. You'll need to plan how you'll comply with your return point obligations. Uh, take some of the points that have been made in the Q&A um, that there isn't clarity at the moment on how uh, how collections are going to work and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, really, really what we can do, both in terms of our skill set as lawyers uh, and at this remove from the go live date, um, is, is confirm what the obligations are. Um, so as long as you understand the obligations, you will at least be able to know if your ability to comply with them is being frustrated by some failure in the uh, the sort of commercial uh, makeup around the scheme, uh, or if not a failure, then a delay in providing information and things like that. And you also want to make sure that you understand and, and are able to anticipate the potential cash flow and cost um, implications for your business, um, particularly some we've not mentioned. Um, but uh, given that the the customer will be entitled to uh, a 20p deposit uh, to have that returned if they return an item to you, if you're a card only retailer, how are you going to manage that? Um, so just a, a little uh, little hand grenade thrown in right at the end there for you to uh, for you to think about. Um, we'll now turn to the Q and A. We've probably already got more than we can answer, but if uh, if you want to add one, please do. Um, we, we wouldn't necessarily be taking them in order. I'll pick out the ones that I think are most relevant. It's very briefly on housekeeping. A reminder, we will be sharing yesterday's session on producer requirements alongside today's session on retailer requirements. So if you were signed up for either, you'll get both. Um, Grant, uh, do you want to think about uh, the question at 139 from, uh, he's given his name, Alan Thomas. Um, in the meantime, I will answer the one above that, which is about market traders who are not mentioned in any of this. Correct. Um, how do traders stand, um, particularly as far as exemption from being a return point operator goes? Um, so uh, market traders aren't mentioned, but they will be a person who, assuming they're selling to consumers, they will be a person who is selling um, scheme articles to consumers, so will have to charge the deposit. The return point obligation is the uh, the sort of the more, more interesting um, more interesting point. Uh, I think we go to the language of the um, of the statute uh, or the legislation there, which says that um, a retailer has to operate a return point at any retail premises in Scotland in which a scheme article is marketed, offered for sale, or sold by that retailer. So the the question in terms of market traders would be: Are they actually operating from? retail premises. If they don't have premises, then there isn't anywhere for them to run a return point uh, scheme, uh, to run a return point from. Um, so that, that would be the question there. Um, and the, the premises is a, is a word that's used throughout legislation. So there's lots of case law about what that means. That would be the key point there. Um, Grant, are you able to pick up Alan's question? Yes, so the, the question was, what happens if you don't sign up with a scheme administrator and how will that be policed? Well, we, we, we covered this yesterday in the context of producers' obligations. So um, it, first of all, the first point to make it is that it is, it is optional to use and engage Circularity Scotland as the as a scheme administrator. It is possible for producers to, um, to effectively run, run the scheme independently. Uh, there are more upfront compliance requirements. And for example, a producer would need to um, 
finalise a business plan and, and and demonstrate that they they have the resource and expertise to run to run the scheme independently. Um, that's why most businesses will will be engaging CSL as the as a scheme administrator. But that that is a producer obligation, as, and there is also a producer agreement that. Uh, any producer that engages CSL would would sign up to the the terms of that producer agreement. Yeah, um, so retailers don't need to register with with the scheme administrator. Although you will you will end up having a a relationship with the scheme administrator in terms of the collection of goods, either directly or indirectly. So the contract for um, the collection um, of uh, sort of the returned items um, that's been awarded to BIFA. Um, so there will certainly be a sort of an indirect relationship through BIFA, if nothing else. Um, Grant, can you pick up the vending machine question from 142? Um, if you, I'll give you a chance to read that while I um, pick up on a few other things. Um, so uh, yeah, we've got quite a few quite a few questions that are um, well, kind of identifying things that are known unknowns at the moment. Um, we we can't offer a great deal of insight on those. Um, certainly, those of you who are in the industry, you'll be plugged into that sort of thing. Keep keep in close contact with things like trade associations. Um, they're, they're gonna be a good route to get information out of governments and, and um, scheme administrator and uh, you know SEPA and, and others um, for issues that are outstanding. But certainly I completely acknowledge the points about why how it's, it's uh, not necessarily great for retailers to not know what the VAT position will be, what the collections route and uplift schedules will be for, for collecting uh, items transition from uh, you know, old old waste scheme to the DRS scheme um, guidelines. So that so there's a question about guidelines for shelf edge labeling. I know that uh, trading standards. Um, I have certainly seen uh, guidance coming out of trading standards in relation to that. Um, so it is available, even though I'm I'm not sure it's nec there is necessarily a sort of single voice speaking for trading standards in in relation to that. Um, Grant, do you want to take the uh, the vending machine point? Yes, thanks, Charles. So the, the question is, if an item is sold via, via a vending machine, for example, from a leisure centre, who's considered the retailer, the owner of the machine or the leisure centre? And would they need to provide a return vending machine? Um, so two, two aspects to that question. First of all, for vending machine sales, it is the owner of the machi machine that is responsible if they are identified on the machine. Um, or otherwise it's the person who's managing the premises where the machine is located. So ultimately it would, it would depend on, um, on what information is, is stated there. Um, the last limb of the question, I assume is referencing um, reverse vending machines. So there is no obligation to, to use or buy and operate a, a reverse vending machine. The, the, the mode or the mechanism of return point collections is, is up to the retailer. Um, ultimately, you need to have a return um, a return point. Um, so that could be that you know you could operate a manual system, or you could select to use a reverse vending machine. Yeah, uh, and I think uh, that question came in before you covered the vending machine point, Grant. In terms of uh, you know if there's no return point obligation if sales are only made on premises by way of a vending machine. So if you know uh, our offices have vending machines in them, we're not going to have to uh, operate a return point by virtue of that. Um, there are a couple of related questions, uh, Grant, at, at one forty-five and one forty-six. Um, if you can just take a sec to read those, and I'll pick up something uh, some other ones. Um, mischievous question here. Um, I can see who it's from, but they haven't said to attribute it. Single-use containers are available at the Scottish Parliament shop. Will they have to accept returns? Um, yes, they will, unless the Scottish ministers uh, grant them an, ex an exemption uh, from that obligation. Um, but they would need to uh, they would need to have um, somewhere uh, somewhere close by uh, that they could identify instead. Um, that connects to another question that I'll field uh, about the um, proximity exemption. Uh, so we said that there needs to be another one close by. The question is, how close is the alternative required to be? Um, so the, the statutory language um, is uh, that there, there needs to be an alternative return point located within reasonable proximity to the premises. Um, I think reasonable proximity will be context specific. So what's reasonable in a very dense 
urban city centre environment um, that might be um, might be pretty uh, pretty short. Um, in a rural environment, um, reasonable might be uh, might be much wider, where um, you know shops are uh, are few and far between. But people will tend to uh, drive rather than walk, so um, are are less. Uh, you'll have fewer people who are um, limited in their ability to 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 get to um, another uh, another return point. Um, Zero Waste Scotland, who uh, field the applications for exemptions, their guidance refers to um, 400 metres. Um, but as I said, I think from a statutory perspective, it's probably um, fairly context specific. Um, so Grant, are you able to field those, those two questions about sort of non-scheme articles? Yeah, so there's a couple in relation to the same similar themes. So the first question was the non-scheme articles as were available prior to the 16th, is that a branded range or the amount available? Um, in this particular example, there's four products available for retail, the 2,000 bottles in each stock. Um, would, there, would those be in or outside of scope if made available past the, the, the 16th of, of August? Well, I think the, the, the basic point there is that if, um, if items are uh, marketed, marketed for sale, before the 16th of August, there would be non non scheme articles and they would not be subject to deposit charging mechanism. There's another question on a similar theme asking if there's a way to identify if the product should be in the scheme or not, i.e. if the product's been manufactured prior to the scheme uh, and if items are ready in circulation for the producers not charged 20p. Um, well, I think Charles, you, you covered this in, in the initial in the initial few slides that ultimately um, if the product um, if the product has been manufactured and placed in the supply chain prior to 16th of August this year, then those products can continue to flow through the supply chain. Yeah. Um, do you want to say something briefly, Grant, about the sort of labelling barcode requirement? We, we covered that in the producer um, session, so we don't need to go into as much detail as that, but maybe just briefly. Sure. So um, there is no mandatory requirement for a producer to change their product labels, albeit um, the products that are placed on market as scheme articles do need to be traceable. And so realistically and practically, if not commercially, the, the most um, effective way of doing that is to have some form of labeling traceability. And the way that that is being um, pushed through is ultimately through changes to the barcode labeling. So, um, What's being referred to as EAN, barcode labeling, European article number labeling. If, if we have products within, if we have products that are intended for England and Wales and Scotland, they would potentially trigger a, a surcharge by the scheme administrator. So you'd effectively have um, products that are circulating freely throughout the UK market if a particular volume quantity is then intended for the Scotland Scottish market, but they don't have separate um, barcode labeling, then that would trigger uh, a surcharge from, from CSL. Of course, if there's Scotland specific DRS barcode labeling, then the surcharge wouldn't, wouldn't apply. Yeah. So, so I, would, I would just flag, add to that, sorry, that there's, there's more complex rules that are to set out in, in the producer agreement that the producer enters into with, with CSL, but that, that is in, in essence the, the gist of how surcharging would, would apply. Yep. Um, so, uh, Grant, got a question at 2.11 about um, selling through Amazon, so that would be the online marketplace point. Um, do you want to have a quick think about that? And I'll pick up a couple of others. Mm -hmm. um, message, message from uh, Janet Hood. She didn't mean to be anonymous. It was Janet's uh, mischievous question about the Scottish Parliament shop. Um, so we have uh, some questions about um, product being sort of pushed onto the market before the go live date of 16th of August. Um, I think certainly from a commercial perspective, that may well happen. Um, it's very reminiscent uh, of um, what happened um, prior to the end of the Brexit transition period. Grant and I did quite a lot of advice on that, where um, you had a lot of manufacturers getting product into the EU um, on the basis that if it was uh, on the EU market, 
um, before the transition period ended, then it could continue to circulate freely without any of the new um, sort of more more difficult restrictions. Um, so uh, the the questioners who've asked about that, I think commercially that probably will happen, and that from a retailer perspective, that probably means it's it's even more important that you work out how you're going to deal with that question of non-scheme articles and how you're going to um, keep uh, keep straight what's what's one item and, and what's another. Um, Grant, do you want to take the online uh, retail point now? Yes, yeah, so the question is, can you clarify the returns if selling through through Amazon? So the, the, the point we mentioned was that online retailers are within scope of the scheme, including potentially online marketplaces. Um, my understanding is that if you are an online retailer, um, but you're holding yourself out there as, as selling selling that stock through um, the the marketplace such as Amazon, you would still hold co the compliance obligations because you're effectively the uh, the retailer in, in that context. Is that would you agree with that, Charles? Um, so from the from a take back perspective, I think the um, it would fall to um, Amazon to run the take back service. Um, which I think was maybe the uh, yeah. So it was specific to to returns. Um, if you're um, if you're uh, selling selling product uh, through an online marketplace, then yeah, you will you will need to make sure that the online marketplace and they will their contract with you will I imagine make sure uh, that you're obliged to give them the information they need to make sure that they comply um, in terms of returns themselves. Uh, so for an online marketplace. Uh, it's the operator of the marketplace that's treated as the retailer for those purposes. So they are the ones who need to run the take back service. But I have absolutely no doubt that um, Amazon and other marketplaces will um, be, be making sure that that activity is, uh, to coin a phrase, cost neutral um, for them um, and that that's being, uh, that's being passed on uh, to the sellers. Um, there may be a couple of uh, other questions. Uh, question, who'll, who'll pocket the surplus money from not returned containers? It depends at what point um, the uh, the container leaves, leaves the loop. So if, for example, a producer sells to a retailer, charges the retailer a 20p deposit, and let's say it's Tesco, and Tesco then take all of that stock and move it to England and sell it in England instead, they won't charge the 20p deposit in England, so they'll be left holding the 20p, um, which is, is unlikely to happen and just indicates that the commercialities mean that once something is in um, the Scottish market and somebody's paid a deposit on it, they'll want to sell it in Scotland to make sure they get their deposit back. Ultimately, if a container is sold to a consumer, um, then the, uh, the consumer pays that 20p to the retailer if the consumer um, never takes that back um, to any return point, then the retailer just keeps that 20p. If the consumer takes it back to a different return point, then the retailer uh, keeps that 20p. Um, and it, but, it, but, it, but it should be working its way through um, because the retailer will have had to pay the deposit when they got the item in to begin with. So the retailer is not out of pocket there. Um, the customer isn't out of pocket if they take it to any return point. Um, and the, the return point um, that accepts it and pays the customer the deposit, then as long as they uh, return the article uh, or have the article collected um, by, by BIFA, um, almost certainly, um, then they'll get the 20p there. So really the only person who's likely to be left out of pocket is the consumer if they fail to return um, a product. Um, I'm conscious of everybody's time. Uh, we could probably go all afternoon. The questions are coming in faster and we can actually answer them. Um, Grant, unless there are any that you've spotted and you really want to pick up, um, then uh, we can uh, we can maybe just follow up on, on anything that we haven't answered separately, would you think? Yeah. No, I, th I think that's, you know, that's fine. And yes, certainly we're, we're very happy to follow up if, um, if, if you're able to, to raise your question and um, yeah, one, one of us can get in touch with you. Yeah, and you can see our contact details there. So, so we, we, we will have a record of the questions um, so we, and we will take a look at those and uh, get in touch um, where it looks like there's, there's something outstanding. Um, but certainly don't hesitate to, uh, to just get ahead of us on that and drop us a line um, with, with anything that we didn't get to here or that you didn't ask or that occurs to you later. Um, we are very, very 
uh, happy to help everybody um, who has any queries about the DRS. Um, and certainly it's it's going to be, it, it already is a red hot topic um, and it's uh, unlikely to cool down anytime between now and August. Um, otherwise, I'll just say thank you to Grant um, and I'll say thanks to all of you for your time and hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Indeed. Thanks, all.